Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm Lisa with Lisa Cape and Quilts. And today I have a really fun video for you, but it's on the longer side. So before I even get started, I'm gonna pull up here on the screen the chapters, the little timestamps where you can skip around to all the different little places in the video where I talk about different stuff. Okay, so in this video, we're gonna be talking about hand stitching. I know, I said it. Uh, I've never had much of a patience for hand stitching, but this year I wanted to work on that, right? And so I've been doing a couple projects. I'm collaborating on a project with a dear friend of mine doing wool applique, and it has really grown an in interest. And I don't wanna say passion yet, but I'm starting to kind of really like it. And uh, so yeah, I hope this is the first of many videos where we're talking about different hand stitches. And uh, I'm learning quite a lot. And just as a disclaimer, as you check out all the timestamps, I'm not a professional hand stitcher. I don't claim to be. The only thing that qualifies me to make this video with you is uh, a willingness to share what I've learned. And I might not have even learned and developed the correct way to do these hand stitches, but I just want to share what I'm doing with you. So that's really the only qualification I have for this video. <laughs> uh, I just want to share it with you. So uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, applique, raw edge applique using feather light, heat and bond feather light. I just got some for the first time and I really kind of like it. Then I'm going to be showing a turned edge applique, fray proof applique using muslin. So uh, there's a segment on that. And then I'm going to show some basic tools and things you might want to gather if you want to start doing some hand stitch uh, applique or, or, or even hand stitch embroidery, right? Or embellishments on your quilts. And then we're going to go over five really simple, basic, and I would say beginner friendly hand stitches that I've used in this project. And let, me, let me just pull this up on the screen before we get started. This is a new pattern I have in my Etsy shop. It is super cute. And uh, yeah, this is a project I'm gonna be demonstrating with today. So now all of that is out of the way and we can just dive right in. And again, feel free to use the timestamps, skip around. You might know about raw edge applique, turned edge applique, and you wanna get down to the hand stitches. So skip around if you want to, or hang out with me the whole time. I hope you enjoy this class. Let's get started. Oh, don't forget, stay tuned to, stay tuned to the end to see uh, these projects all finished up. All right, now let's get started. So before we can start stitching, either with the sewing machine or by hand, we first have to prep and cut out our applique shapes, right? So the first method uh, and the first way I'm gonna make this little mini quilt is using raw edge applique. So my go-to has always been Heat and Bond Light. This is my favorite fusible product. There are many, many, many uh, different kinds of fusibles out there on the market for you to choose from. This just happens to be my favorite. Well, in my research and all of watching tutorials on wool applique, which I am just starting to dive into, I noticed a lot of the wool appliqueers were using Heat and Bond Feather Light. I didn't even know there was such a thing. So I ordered some to give it a try. So this is going to be actually my first project using it, but uh, it's supposed to offer the same hold, but be even lighter than the Heat and Bond Light. And I'm thinking for hand sewing, uh, it should offer less resistance poking that needle through by hand, right? So I'm going to do two projects, one hand sewing with this, uh, and the other one I'm going to machine sew with this and just try it out and see what I think. Uh, but the instructions are super simple, right? You'll want to read the instructions for whatever kind of fusible you're using. I traced all of my pieces for my birds. So I have them and they're all separated, not cut out on the line yet. You'll want to leave yourself a little bit of space uh, around each one of your uh, pieces, right? We don't cut that out on the line yet. And uh, I have two sets because I'm going to make two projects, one hand sewn, one machine sewn with the feather light. So, uh, but yeah, heat and bond light should work just the same as well. So let me go fuse these templates on some fabrics 
that's going to take me a little while to figure out which fabrics I want to use for the cute little birds. And I will then cut out my pieces and we're going to come back uh, when we're ready to fuse them into place. So anytime you're doing a project, there's probably handfuls of ways to uh, to accomplish the project, right? Another way I wanted to show you real quick and just demonstrate, if you wanted not to do a raw edge applique, but you wanted to do an easy turned applique project, uh, is to grab yourself some lightweight muslin this is from joann's it's in the muslin department it's not the most expensive muslin it's not the cheapest muslin it's like a mid-grade muslin uh and i i'm sorry i don't have the name of it because uh there's no writing on the salvage edge and i've had this for quite some time but just a, a mid-grade muslin that you can easily see through right you can see that template through the muslin uh, I'm going to trace my template pieces and I'm going to make a coaster project to go along with my little mini quilts. And on this project, we're going to do turned edge applique. Now, one of the cool things about turned edge applique, and I'm just using uh, a friction fine line um, pen to trace because these markings will erase in that seam allowance once we're done. Um, the cool thing about doing it this way is if you don't want your applique pieces to ever fray, right? Let's say you're doing some applique in a project that you know is going to get washed and you don't want it to ever fray. Turned, at, turned edge applique is the way to go, right? My preferred method is raw edge applique. But we're going to make this little coaster with some turned edge applique. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind if you decide to go this route is this muslin does add some thickness to your applique. So if you're hand sewing, you might have a little bit of a uh, harder time getting your needle through this extra layer of muslin. That might be something to think about. You may or may not have to deal with that. Um, and your applique will not lay as flat on the top of your project because of this extra layer of muslin, right? And uh, I'll show you some examples throughout this video of the raw edge applique versus uh, the dimension that this is going to add to our project. But if you like that extra layer of dimension and texture in your projects, you might want to think about doing this. Now, uh, I've already done this once <laughs> on one of these little mini quilts. And this piece here, uh, I struggled with and I struggled with and I struggled with turning this. So uh, this piece of this project, I'm doing with some fusible because I prefer not to lose my mind over that one little beak part. <laughs> Turning that piece uh, was kind of difficult for me, but the other pieces turned very easily. So I have the bigger pieces of the bird just traced on some muslin. Just like uh, the fusible, we're going to separate these pieces, not cutting them out on the line yet. We're going to give ourselves a little bit of space around each piece, and uh, and then we'll get to this. A lot of the times when I'm doing layered applique, uh, I like to use my silicone pressing mat. Now I do have the applique mat, which has a purple border. Then I ordered a bunch of these uh, Amazon Basics, and you get a really great deal on these. Uh, but you can press right on the mat and layer your applique before you bring it over to your project. So that's what we're going to do with this first bird. We can just line up the pieces. Let's see. We can see where the tail goes and the silicone mat just sort of grips these pieces so they don't slide around. We can see where the beak goes and then we can layer his body, the bird's body, right on top and get the perfect placement. 
And we're just going to press that for a second. Right, just up and down motions. I'm going to go ahead and put this, uh, his wing on too, while we're right here. Now you can't see the wing placement, so we're just eyeballing that. Then we're going to let that cool off for a second. We'll bring in the top of our project. And then we can just peel this applique right off the mat. And all of our pieces stay fused together so they're perfectly placed. Pardon the trash truck going by. <laughs> oh no, I think today's recycling day. So we can just then place our bird, right? Remember with the birds, when you're placing them, they have the little bit of a longer, skinnier legs on them. So make sure you leave plenty of space there. And also make sure that you leave space for a binding up at the top. You don't want to cut the bird's head off with your binding. So we can just put that bird there and fuse him in place. This is for your raw edge projects, or you can also eyeball it with the little placement uh, shaded areas on your pattern as well too, right? So let's take this paper off and let's do that with the second bird. I'm trying not to rip this big piece because we're gonna use that to place our pieces. So the other bird is going the other direction, right? One's going one way and one's going the other. Remember our legs are gonna come down a little bit like that. So before we fuse anything, we're just going to kind of eyeball it and put it into place. that way we'll just put that template right over top of that piece and slip the tail right underneath now these pieces might move a little bit so I'm just gonna hit that just for a second so it doesn't move right and then we have the little beak I'm just scoring that paper with a pen. I find it a lot easier to take the paper off that way. And now we can lift up that bird fabric and slide the beak right under there. And we can give that a quick press so it doesn't move and we have the wing for this bottom bird. Look, I have little blue birds. <laughs> All right, and we're just putting that wing right there. I think that looks great. And let's give a final fuse to this bottom bird. Now, once that cools off completely, we will slip this little pattern template page right up underneath. And with a heat erasing pen, I don't know if you can see that, but the little bird legs, we can just trace the little bird legs one at a time with a heat erasing pen just to give us those markings. Now with our turned edge applique pieces, we have a little bit of work to do before we can fuse this applique to the top of our project, right? So uh, I have the body of the bird fabric. We're going to put that with the pretty side, the right side facing up. And then we can bring in our piece of muslin that has the traced lines on it. And we're putting the trace lines facing up. And we're going to sew around each one of these pieces all the way around, right? And uh, I don't usually do a back stitch here. What I like to do just to keep this uh, sewing, line, sewing line nice and thin is let's say I start here. I'll sew all the way around. And when I get back to where I started, I just overlap that by about 10 stitches and that should be enough to lock these stitches in place, right? One tip as you're sewing these, you might want to use a little bit of a shorter 
um, stitch length. So I'm going to lower my stitch length to a 2.0 on my machine. You might need to play around with the settings on your machine, but I like a little bit of a shorter stitch when doing this. So uh, I'll just bring you along and I'm going to stitch around all of these pieces. So now that each one of these pieces have been stitched all the way around, sorry about the horrible lighting, <laughs> we can trim away this extra fabric, right? And with these pieces, I like to leave a very, very small seam allowance. Very small. You might want to clip any of the uh, curved edges and ed any edges that come in down into a valley, right? Uh, I like to leave a very small little seam allowance. See that? Now, uh, as we get ready to turn these, we have not used any glue yet, right? So we can separate the two pieces like that. We want to make sure we pull away this fabric for the applique away from that muslin. And we're just going to poke some scissors right through that muslin and cut a small little slit. I like to sometimes cut my slit a couple of different ways. That just helps me turn this right side out. And then we're just turning. So I'm going to save you a little bit of time and turn this uh, fast forwarded. So here we are with the little wing of our bird. For each one of these pieces, I'll turn them just like that, and then I'll give them a quick little press. It'll help flatten this piece a little bit more and give it some nicer, uh, cleaner edges. So let me go do that, and then we're gonna meet with the top of our coaster. So for the turned edge applique, once you have pressed all of your pieces, see there's the hole right in the center. I reckon if you wanted to remove some of the thickness, you could come in and trim some of this away, right? It might make your applique a little bit uneven, uh, but if you want to remove some of the weight, I particularly like the thickness on some of my projects because it adds a lot of texture to, uh, to the project, right? So it depends on the look you're going for. So for my coaster, I just have a piece of tea stained muslin and I haven't really even cut it to size yet. We're just going to lay and eyeball these pieces. All right, let me grab the little beak because I forgot that. So there's my beak piece. That's the only piece I didn't turn. <laughs> uh, you can fuse this in place a couple of different ways. You could thread baste it in place, right? You could do that. You could use pins. Uh, I'm a huge glue baster. You could use uh, an Elmer's school glue stick or an Elmer's wet glue. Either one, uh, you want to use it very sparingly, especially if you're hand sewing, right? Because uh, you don't want to make it even more difficult to go through the edges of your project. So let's just take some of this glue stick and let's put it right in the middle of the bird's body, just to tack it down like so, right? And I'm just finger pressing that because I still want to lift up the edges to put these pieces in place. I do think the glue stick is a lighter hold than um, the wet glue. You could use either one. I think I'm gonna use the glue stick. Now this piece, I will put a little bit around the edges, right? Because we want those edges to stay in place. 
and we're just going to layer it like that. And then the beak has fusible on it. We're just going to slide it up under like that. Now let's give that a good little fuse and we're drying that glue, pressing with a good hot iron. I have it on the cotton setting. And that should do it. And now we can bring in the wing piece. Uh, let me just show you if you were to use the wet glue. If you have one of those tips that puts out the little, little tiny dots, you might want to use that. Otherwise, just tiny little dots, tiny little dots. Do you see that? Tiny little dots. That's all, all it takes. Tiny little smidgen dots. You can barely even see them. <laughs> And we'll put the wing in place and dry that glue. We're not hand sewing through any wet glue. And we're not machine sewing through any wet glue. So I thought for my coaster, I will show you some hand sewing through this. To show you it is possible. It's just a little bit thicker, right? And then I'm going to machine sew parts of the applique as well. All right. Where are we at? Let me go assess where we are. I think uh, to save some time in today's video, which is already going to be on the longer side, I'm going to machine stitch one of these projects just so I can test out the Featherlight uh, Fusible. Before we dive in and start with the different hand stitches that I'm going to show you today, I thought I would just start by showing you some of the tools that I carry with me when I'm doing these hand stitches. Uh, first, some of the needles that you might use have those little tiny, tiny eyes and, or your thread might be just hard to put through the needle of the eye, right? So you might want to have a needle threader. Uh, this one, I thought I would love it. I don't love it, uh, but I do use it from time to time. This one is actually my favorite. It was gifted to me from my daughter and I use this pretty much all the time. You might also find it helpful, uh, depending on the thread that you're using, to have some kind of thread conditioner. And uh, I just have this Thread Magic. I got that from Joanne Fabrics quite some time ago. <laughs> and uh, as far as I know, it, it never really goes bad. It's still working, and it's been several years. Uh, I have a pair of scissors or some snips. And uh, you might find it helpful to mark your stitches depending on the kind of stitch you're doing to have a heat erasing uh, marker right or some pencils that disappear somehow so uh, i use this friction fine liner for a lot of my marking especially with like the couching foot or the couching stitch i keep wanting to call it couching foot so those are the basic things i have in my little bag when i'm traveling around doing these stitches. Next we're going to talk about the needles because there's a million different kinds of needles out there and uh, it can be really confusing when you're trying to figure out which needles do I use. I don't, to be really honest, I don't know that there's a right and a wrong answer for this. I think whatever needle works best for you and that is easiest for you to use, use that needle. <laughs> And uh, so this can all be really confusing, right? Let's go over some of the needles uh, that I have. And I've had these forever. These are the self-threading needles. I use these from time to time. Uh, it's really convenient because they are self-threading. But they're awful short. So uh, I do find sometimes they're hard to work with uh, because of the length. And they're, they're pretty short. Um... And these I've had a long time. I don't even know who made these. These have been in my sewing box forever. Uh, and actually, I really love them for a couple reasons. You'll see three different sizes here. I kind of like the length of these longer ones because I can travel uh, to longer distances away from my stitches, right? And, uh, and these are pretty strong needles. They don't really bend. They do have quite a small little eye, so the needle threader comes in really handy. 
Um, but one of the reasons why I love this needle is because if you notice, and I'm hoping you can see it, the thickness of the needle, it is super thin, but it's really strong, right? It doesn't bend. Uh, but the thickness of the needle when going through your applique or your background fabric is going to leave a really tiny, small hole. Matter of fact, when the thread goes through it, you don't even see the hole from the needle. Whereas if you're using a bigger needle, like maybe these embroidery needles, especially the ones in the middle, this is going to leave a, a bigger size hole in your fabric and you might see the hole that's left behind if the thread doesn't fill that hole, right? So uh, the thickness of your needle does play a little bit of a role in your hand stitching. You'll notice the eyes of the needle are really big on these embroidery needles, so you might be tempted to use them. And just being real with you, if this is easier for you to use, then use them. <laughs> um, and then I have these Milner needles. Uh, I really like these too. The eye on these are a little bit bigger and it's got a really good length to them. And also they're really strong and uh, I can travel good distances with these as well. And then uh, for my thicker threads, and actually I purchased these when I bought the stuff to do my wool applique and uh, I really like them. They're a little bit on the shorter side, uh, but that's okay. These are a size 24 chenille needle. And uh, let me show you the eye on this needle. Um, I don't know, hopefully you can see that. I'm gonna focus on that. It has a long eye in the needle and it sort of slopes from top to bottom like that. And so uh, I have found that this is really great for using uh, the thicker threads like the DMC thread or the pearl cotton thread because that thicker thread gets squished down into the slope of the eye. And uh, for me, it helps the thread not come out of the eye of the needle when you're stitching. So yeah, I mean, the, there's all kinds of needles out there. Uh, you, my goal would be to say, find one that stitches through your fabric easily without creating so much work for yourself. If you're having to struggle to pull that needle through, you're going to want to find a smaller needle to work with, right? And then, um, of course, one of these. These will help so much, <laughs> right? So that's those tools and the needles. Let's talk about some thread. When it comes to thread, again, I don't know if there is a right answer or a wrong answer. I think we have to think about the results we're looking for with our applique. What do we want it to look like when it's finished? And what is easy for us to handle and to sew with, right? Uh, I'm going to show you an array of threads that I've been using that I had on hand. And... um I'll put a list over in the top corner over there of some threads that I'm looking at purchasing uh, down the road. I don't have any of these, but I've watched so many tutorials in the last two weeks, and these threads come highly recommended. So if you're looking at purchasing thread, you might want to look at some of these, but you might want to check out some of those too. Um, so let's just start with what I have here on my table. This is some... I believe this is a 30 weight. The sticker's gone. Machine Quilting Cotton from Joann's. I really like the weight of this. And uh, it's strong thread, so I can really pull it snug uh, to my project without it breaking. If you're sewing with a thread that keeps breaking, if you're pulling it, you need to switch your thread. Don't get frustrated and, uh, throughout your whole project. You need to find a thread that's super strong that you can work with that doesn't keep breaking. This is great. Uh, if you're looking for an invisible thread so that your stitches don't show at all, you might wanna check out a monofilament thread. This is a silky, a sulky, this is like the smoky color and it blends in with so many fabrics. Uh, it's super duper thin, like I don't even know if you can see that. <laughs> but uh, for me, I find this very difficult to work with and I'm trying to work on my patience with hand sewing 
and this works on my patients. So I don't hardly ever use that. I do have uh, some brown 12 weight thread. Uh, Angel from Halo sent me this. This is awesome. I've used it several times in the projects I'm showing you today. Uh, this is great thread. This is a cotton thread. Yes, 100% cotton. Super strong, a nice little weight to it, 12 weight. Then uh, I have this dual duty. I think this is a Coates uh, brand thread from Joanne Fabrics. This is a 25 weight. It's actually a hand quilting thread, but it's super strong. And uh, I like using this. This is also another Coates thread. This is quilting and piecing thread. And this is a 35 weight, so it's a little bit... Uh, see the thickness of the thread? Yeah, I really like this thread too. Uh, I have used some of my quilting threads. So this is a YLI Egyptian cotton thread. And uh, it's variated. And uh, this is a 40 weight thread. So you can see the thickness of that. This almost disappears. You'll see this later on when I do the whip stitch. Uh, okay, so and then... The thicker threads, right? I purchased this for doing wool applique, but I have used this in today's projects as well. This is the number eight pearl cotton thread. It sews wonderfully. Uh, it hardly ever tangles, and I love it. I am using mostly this, some DMC thread, but mostly this on my wool applique project. And uh, yes, I love it. I love the weight of this thread. And then, uh, of course, we have our DMC threads. So look at that beauty. I have uh, six or seven of these full containers as like a little inheritance. I call it an inheritance from my Nana who was an avid cross stitcher. And so you can certainly use this thread as well. And the beauty of the DMC thread is that you have so many options, right? Um, and you can pick up a lot of colors for a relatively low cost, too, right? I do recommend a, a good brand, a, a higher quality DMC thread. Uh, and what's really nice about this is you have some options within the strand of thread, right? You can use it as the full thickness of the thread. So if you really want your stitches to show up and to be part of the design element in your project, you can go with the full strand. Or if you want a thinner stitch, you can separate this, right? This will make your DMC thread go further, but it also thin out your stitch. So you can separate the strands and use two or three, just like that, right? So uh, yeah, I've used the DMC thread uh, quite a bit. And uh, I am using some of the DMC thread in my wool applique project I'm working on uh, because I just didn't have the colors in the pearl cotton for that project that I wanted to use. By all means, the thread that I've shown you today, this is <laughs> this doesn't even touch what you could use. Again, uh, I don't know that there's any rules. The only thing I would say is that if you're struggling with the thread you're using, try changing it to a different thread, right? There's no, um, doing all the hand stitches takes enough patience. If you add uh, the difficulty level of working with a thread that's not working, you're just gonna get super frustrated and just not do it at all, right? So work with a thread that works with you. <laughs> so let's get on to our first stitch of this project. When you're ready to get started sewing, uh, you wanna thread your needle and put a little knot at the end of your thread. So I'm gonna just quickly show you how I knot the end of my thread. Of course, there's a million ways to do this. Uh, so I bring up the tail end of my thread and my needle, and I'm holding the needle in my right hand. I lay the tail of the thread right on my pointer finger and I just lay the needle 
right over top of it so it pinches that thread. Now I'm going to take the long thread and I wrap it around my needle. Depending on the thickness of your thread, you may need more wraps, you may need fewer wraps. This is a number eight pearl cotton. And so it's kind of thick and two wraps forms a really nice size knot. You'll notice I'm holding the long thread with my fingers and pulling some tension so that those wraps stay nice and tight wrapped around my needle. And I just scoot those wraps down close together. Still pinching the needle on my finger. I'm gonna just reach up with my thumb and pinch those wraps. We can then pull the needle right through. I'm still pinching those wraps and I pull it through to the base or the bottom of my thread. And there is my little knot. So give that a try if you haven't uh, tried that method. This might work for you. Again, there's a million ways to put the little knot at the end of your thread. To tie off your work on the back, whenever you're done with any of the stitches that I'm gonna show you, uh, unfortunately I'm working with a lighter thread to show you this, hopefully you can see this. Uh, there's actually several ways that you can do this. I'm gonna show you the easiest way, is that if you have stitches that are uh, close by, I like to bring my needle underneath of one of those stitches and draw up the thread so that you have a little loop. See that loop? I'll then, let me make sure it's not twisted, I'll then bring my needle through that loop, and I usually bring it through twice, so twice through the loop, and then we're gonna pull on the long thread connected to the needle so that that knot comes right down close to the stitch. And that is probably the easiest way to tie off your work for any of these stitches. Now, let's say um, that you're doing a stitch and you don't have any stitches close by. So I'm gonna travel underneath of this applique so you don't see it. <laughs> let's just travel. Traveling for example purposes only, right? Let's say you've been stitching and you're not close to any stitches uh, when you're ready to tie off your work. What you can do is take a quick little short tiny stitch right next to where you came up out of the fabric and form your loop. And then go through the loop Again, I like to go through two times and then just gently pull on that thread until it forms your little knot. So that's how I am tying off my stitches. For the bird's legs, I'm using uh, a, the couching stitch and two small straight stitches for the little bird's feet. So to start the couching stitch, I'm gonna come up near the bird's body right below that edge. We're gonna pull that knot snug against the back of the fabric. Now we're going to just lay our thread right over our traced line. We're not gonna pull it tight, we're just gonna lay it nice and straight. We're gonna bring our needle right down to the top of this V section for the feet, just straight through to the back. That's the beginning of our couching stitch, right? We're gonna just pull that snug, but not too tight so it doesn't bunch up the fabric. So that's the beginning of our couching stitch. We're gonna pause on that for a second because we're gonna do the two straight stitches at the bottom. And a straight stitch is exactly that. It's a medium length straight stitch, right? So uh, our thread is on the back. Let's come up at the bottom of one of his little feet. Keep 
keeping that thread nice and snug but not super tight. We're going to travel back up and go right back into the hole we created in the top of this V section with our couching stitch. So that's our first straight stitch. Now we're going to travel back and we're going to come up at the bottom of his other little toe or foot <laughs> claw. <laughs> the other side of his little foot. We're gonna pull that thread snug and we're gonna travel right back down into that same hole at the bottom of the couching stitch. So that completes our two little short straight stitches at the bottom, right? There's his little foot. And now we can complete the couching stitch as we work our way back up to the bottom of the bird. So to finish the couching stitch, I'm going to come up right next to on the left side of this thread. You can even move that thread over if you want to. We're going to come up right on that traced line on the left side of the thread. And then we're just going to scoot that thread over and we're going to go right back down into that same hole, but on the right side of the thread. That's going to anchor down or couch down this long stitch. See that? We've just anchored it down right there. You can do a couple more on our way up. You can do as many or as few as you like. I'm doing about three for his legs. And there we go, there's our couching stitch and our two little straight stitches. Now we'll just tie this off on the back and move to the next stitch. For the eyes of the bird, I've been doing a French knot. So I have a full strand, all the little strands of some DMC thread and uh, a chenille needle that has the larger eye. And to start this stitch, we're gonna come up from the back wherever you want your little eye to be for the bird. And we're gonna pull that thread all the way up. And the knot is snug against the back. We're gonna take this thread and we're gonna hold it in our hands like this, right? Uh, I like to work with a little bit of a shorter thread. Usually to do this knot, I have a bit of an easier time. We're going to take our needle, I'm right-handed, in my right hand, and we're going to bring that needle right over, and we're going to take our thread, and we're going to wrap it around the needle. Now, depending on how big you want your French knot to be, will uh, determine how many times you wrap around your needle. I think usually it's recommended like two to three times. Uh, so yeah, we're going to go with three, so we have a little bit of a bigger eye for our bird. So we're going to wrap the thread right around the needle one, two, three times. That's three complete wraps around our needle. Now I'm still holding this thread and pulling a little bit of tension so the wraps don't get loose on my needle. Pulling that tension on my thread, I'm going to bring the needle, the tip of the needle, back to where we came up out of uh, the fabric, right? And you can either go into the same hole or go right next to it. I like to sometimes go right next to it. So the tip of my needle is back down. We're gonna just pull some tension on that thread and I'm gonna hold it with my thumb. See that? And I'm going to pull that needle back through to the back. 
holding the long thread with the tension on my thumb. There we go. A pretty little eye for our bird, and that's the French knot. Now you'll tie this off on the back and we'll head to the next stitch. Now we're gonna work on the blanket stitch, which is uh, the stitch that I used to sew down the body of the bird and the wings of the bird on this project. Cute little hand stitch. It forms this little outline around your applique and I think it's adorable. So there's many ways to start the blanket stitch. I'm gonna show you how I start mine. Uh, I have the knot on the end of my thread and we're gonna start from behind the project and I like to bring my needle, ouch, I just poked myself, up through the background, right next to my applique. See my needle there? It's right next to my applique piece and we're gonna be stitching down the wing. Bring that thread all the way up through and now we're going to stitch into the applique and you can make this stitch as short or as long as you want. I think the hardest part of this stitch for me is keeping all of my stitch lengths uh, consistent, <laughs> uh, but I think that'll take some practice. So we're gonna take our needle to form our first stitch right down back through to the back. And let's bring that thread all the way back through. So that is our very first stitch right there. The third part, or the next step, is to come right back up where we started. So you're gonna bring that needle right back up in the same hole as our first uh, part of that stitch. All right, so from here on out, we are keeping this thread not all the way pulled through the fabric. It's gonna play a vital role in this stitch. Uh, so now we're gonna determine how far apart we want our stitches, right? So we can just move right on over for our second stitch. And when I go down, I'm gonna be going down inside the wing and coming up in the background fabric. And I like to work uh, mostly with this stitch, just traveling through to the back without bringing my needle all the way through. So I'm going to pivot that fabric and just come up right next to the edge of that wing. See that? Now to form the blanket stitch, we're going to take our long thread and we're going to wrap it behind that needle. We're going to hold it in place and pull that thread through. So there is our second stitch. And don't be afraid to tug and pull uh, some tension on that thread. So now for our third stitch. Again, we're starting in the applique fabric. And I just like to pinch my fabric over so that it allows the needle to come up right next to uh, the applique. It is going through the background. I don't know if you can see that needle but it is going behind the back of the piece and coming up next to that applique. Take your thread, wrap it behind the needle, and pull your needle through. We'll do a couple more. Wrap that thread behind the needle I like to just pinch it with my thumb <laughs> and pull all the way through. Let's do one more. Down through the back, up next to the applique, wrap the thread around the needle, pinch it with my thumb and pull the needle through. Now I'm gonna do a few more stitches until I run a little short on my thread. So I'll show you how to pick back up if you need to change thread. 
All right, I've worked myself around a little bit and I don't like to let my thread get too, too short because then I have a hard time tying the knot on the back, right? So uh, I've taken this stitch here and you can see that second part of the blanket stitch is just loose there and we can pull it tight just like that. So if you want to, if you need to, switch your thread before your stitch is done. See this part that loops right over that thread? We're gonna pull it tight and we're gonna come down to the right of this stitch, just right next to it, to the right, just like that. And it should anchor this blanket stitch down just like that, see? Nice and anchored and now we can tie this off and start again. So let me get some new thread on my needle and we will pick back up where we've left off. All right, I have some new thread on my needle. We're going to come right back to where we left off. And I'm gonna bring my needle. Okay, I want you to see this last stitch right there. Uh, I'm gonna bring my needle right before this last stitch, right into the straight part of this blanket stitch right next to the applique. Just right into it so that it just blends in. And this is how I do it. I'm not sure if it's the correct way or not, but this way really works for me and it blends right in. So here's my needle coming out right in that straight part of the stitch. And now we can just pick back up like we never ever cut the thread, right? So we take our next stitch. Starting in the applique and coming out next to the applique, we make sure our thread is behind the needle. And we pull. And we just keep working our way around. Now what I'd like to do next is work all the way through and to the very end, and I'll show you how I finish my blanket stitch. So here we are, uh, I've worked my way around and you'll see I have space for one more stitch, right? So I thought I would finish off this blanket stitch with you to see how I do it. I have space for just one more stitch evenly between the first and where I am now. So uh, I go in through my applique and I come out next to my applique. I wrap the thread behind the needle and pull that needle through. So there's my last stitch. And you'll see there's a gap between your last stitch and your first stitch. And all it really is is the outline part of the stitch that goes around the applique. So I just take my needle and I travel over and just on the right side, I don't know if you can see that, just on the right side of that first stitch, I'm gonna lower my needle right into the fabric and pull my needle through. Pull it snug against the fabric and there you go. That is the how you finish off the blanket stitch. So we're gonna tie this off and at this point all we have left is the whip stitch. The last of the stitches I wanna share with you today is uh, called the whip stitch. A very quick little whimsical stitch and uh, I actually use what I call the whip stitch to hand sew my bindings when I very rarely hand sew my bindings. Uh, usually I machine stitch those. But uh, so we're going to actually use the whip stitch to sew down the tail of the bird and the beak. And I've already done the beak and I just wanted to show you as a comparison uh, the importance or the role that the thread plays when you're hand stitching and what a difference it can make. So I've already sewn the beak of the bird and I used a 40 weight YLI thread. It's actually one of my quilting threads here on the cone. Um, and it really just blends in to the fabric. You can, 
when you stand back, you can hardly see it. Up close, you can see it. But it just almost disappears right on the beak of the bird. So a lot of the times you might be looking for uh, a finish much like this one. These threads with the blanket stitch, I've used a thicker thread. And so it really plays a role in the design of the applique, right? Uh, so I'm going to do the whip stitch with a thicker thread so that you can really see what I'm doing. And uh, this is the number eight pearl cotton. And uh, for that thread, I am using a chenille needle. And uh, we're just gonna walk through how I do my little whip stitch. This is the turned applique. So we do have the extra layer of muslin that we're going through. Make sure we're focused. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start by bringing my needle up into the applique. And I really think that you could make your whip stitches as big as you want or as small as you want, right? Uh, you can almost you even, I, I believe that some people call this an applique stitch because you can sew down your appliques with it, but you can also bring it right out at the edge of your applique and so that it's pretty much invisible too, right? I kind of want my whip stitch to be a feature of the design. So we're gonna make the whip stitches a little bit bigger. So I've come up into the applique and now I'm bringing my needle right next to the applique into the background fabric and I'm just gonna travel up to where I want my next stitch. And when I come back up, I'm coming back up into that applique fabric. We're gonna pull that thread and then lower the needle right next to the applique into the background and travel over and come back up in the applique like that. You can space these out as far apart as you like or as close together as you like. So when we're coming up, we're coming up in that applique fabric. And when we go back down, we're in the background. We travel underneath and come back up in the applique fabric. And I'm just pulling it so it's snug, but not real tight so that it doesn't bunch up this background fabric. When we travel over to take the stitch into the background, we're just making a straight line from where we came up right over and right down into that background. This is how I hand sew my bindings. <laughs> Not many of them get done this way, but this is how I do mine. You can see I'm spacing mine out pretty far uh, because this is turned edge applique, I'm really not worried about it ever fraying. And uh, so I feel like I can take the wider stitches. And that's okay. And this stitch goes by pretty quick. We'll do this whole tail piece together. I'm going to take one more that's right close to the body of the bird. So we're coming up in the applique fabric and to finish it off, we're just going to travel right down into the background fabric and we're going to pull the thread to the back. And of course we would tie it off. And that is 
our little whip stitch. So after you're done with the all of your hand stitching, you can go ahead and layer your project and do your quilting and your binding. You'll see each one of these projects. I did a little different quilting design. Super simple. I just kept it really simple, but uh, I think each one is super cute. So I'm just going to bring you through and show you each one of these projects. And I did add the dimensions for the little coaster because isn't that cute with the little single bird on there? I did add the dimensions for the coaster into the pattern. So isn't she so cute? Here's the one that I machine stitched. Just as cute as the hand stitched one. My little bluebirds. I kept the quilting very, very basic and simple on that and I really like it. And then here's my last one with just a simple little meandering quilting in the background. So just by changing the thread and, and your stitches, you can change the look of your applique. I hope that this has inspired you to uh, pull out some needle and thread and try some hand stitches. I would love to know what you think down in the comments section. And if you have questions, you can ask there. And I would love to try to help if I'm able to. So thanks for hanging out with me today. And uh, I'll see y'all really soon. Bye, everybody.